Yeah, I saw it as a, as a one-way ticket. No intentions of ever going back, ever doing anything related to poverty, economic development, nothing. Um, I had escaped Africa, was sort of how I saw it. But then something happened in February 2008. I started reading books on just economic development, global poverty, and it gripped me like nothing had ever gripped me before. In 2016, I started The People of Chelsea. And that was to go out on the streets with the backdrop and just photograph people as they walked by because Chelsea is filled with so many different ethnicities and cultures and you know that's what makes a city so special and we're an immigrant city all that stuff so I started out um, on the streets with the backdrop and then I realized I need stories what am I doing I gotta I need interviews but I'm staying up till 2 3 in the morning reading these books and <clears throat> going to work the following day that's when I knew something was happening uh, cut the long story short, started a nonprofit with a friend and um, started working on anti poverty type efforts. Uh, after we did a few projects, I realized this thing wasn't working. We were, we were fixing symptoms of the problem, not actually getting at the root cause. And so, uh, you know, cutting the long story short, I was fortunate to get into business school. I thought I'd go back to business school. And, Anyways, I, I got to Harvard, uh, which is where I met Professor Clay Christensen. Uh, and, you know, he's this, like, master of innovation, came up with disruptive innovation theory. He's uh, advised, you know, the late Intel's Andy Grove, uh, uh, Steve Jobs. One of the only books he read was my professor's book. I mean, this, Clay Christensen was, was a master. You know, he passed away in January of last year. So, uh, anyways, I studied with him. And I got the chance to work with him right after graduation. And uh, we were fortunate to, to uh, co-author a book called The Prosperity Paradox, How Innovation Lifts Nations Out of Poverty. And really the core message in the book and the core message in my research uh, that I do at the Clayton Christensen Institute is on really reframing this issue of poverty. They had lines started at like nine in the morning. The food was supposed to be there at one, and it didn't arrive until like five in the afternoon. So people were in line all day in the rain. The volunteers are in tears watching this happen, you know. And so those are the images. And I didn't really know all this stuff, you know, when I was in there. I was just kind of shooting. And then I, I learned all these stories, and then they would tell me these stories. And then Martita, one of the volunteers, was you know crying when she's talking to me. She's like, "Poor people are." waiting for food, they need food. And these are immigrants that, they come to our country to work. They don't come to stand in food lines, you know, because I remember people were like, oh, they're homeless? I mean, no, they're gonna be. But no, they're, you know, they're people like us that, you know, are essential workers, however, and they, you know, need to feed their families. I often get asked, so what are you trying to say, folks, so that we should make money from the poor? I said, look, I, I normally say, look, that's one of the best things you can do is to make money from the poor, not in an egregious, like exploitative way, but in a way that helps them make progress. Because when you do that, ultimately what you're saying is, I value you enough to wake up every day to innovate for you um, and to, to, to serve you as a customer um, because you know we all know the wealthiest in society are served every day uh, people you know open the door for them and they try to sell them things but when we take that kind of mindset to people who are living in poverty and struggling and saying let me figure out how to create a product or service that works for you meets you where you are and helps take you to the next level oh my that that's that's sustainable transformation that the qu question we ask is, how, how can we create prosperity? Not so much how can we alleviate poverty. Because when you alleviate poverty, you think about a, a sick patient, right? And I got a headache, um, I got chills. You can alleviate my symptoms, my pain. But until you get at the root cause of what's going on with me, you're just going to be alleviating uh, my pain for a long time. 
Um, and so our question is, how can we create prosperity? Because when you create prosperity, you get, you get rid of poverty, right? Mm -hmm. And we found out that innovation plays a critical role. Entrepreneurs did not wait for people to become wealthy enough to, to afford the innovations on the market. I still cannot afford even a mini computer at the cost of a couple hundred thousand dollars, right? Um, what they did was they woke up every day and thought about the people who lacked access. So it'd be a lot of the people who were lower income, middle income, living in poverty, and they thought about those people with a level of dignity that said, I want to innovate for you. I want to create a product, product or a service for you that helps you make progress in your life. And when you do that as an entrepreneur, what you do in addition to creating a market is treating people with a level of dignity uh, that many times they don't have as they go through life. You know, if you see somebody on the street, you know, do you give them cash? You know, then I think maybe I'd rather give food because we don't know their background. You know, and does that, that make sense? Well, I do, but I think that's the challenge that we're trying to overcome is yeah. that if you ultimately want to give somebody a hand up instead of a handout, you've got to respect their autonomy as an adult. Mm -hmm. And so giving someone money is a sign of respect of saying, here, solve your problems. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I think that if we just want to say, I'm going to give you what I think you need, how are you really helping me function as an adult in that same way? Now, it's still e extremely valuable. If mm -hmm. someone hands me food when I need it, diapers when mm -hmm. I need it, but there's a certain level of dignity that I receive when you give me the freedom to make my choices for myself. And I think that's what we have to change in that narrative about giving someone money. It's, uh, it's the ultimate sign of respect. I mean, you need money. You know, the food and everything is great, but you need money. You know, to, to survive. It is what it is, you know. Money, wealth, they gotta keep it there. They're not gonna put much into the hood as they should, but they really need to do something about this because the rest of this, what we're seeing out here, you take a look around you, like, none of this isn't, you know, this isn't right at all, period. You know, the word redistribution is, is it's, it's like a bad word, but I mean, what is, the go what is the job of a government, right? I mean, you think about it, right? The government doesn't really create anything. I mean, they create value, but they don't really create anything. What the government does is they tax people. They tax corporations in many different ways, right? So, you know, for me to have my car, I get, I got to pay something every year. My house, I pay something every year. The government didn't build the house, they didn't, they didn't build the car. So they tax, right? And then they get all these resources. And what do they do? They redistribute it. They redistribute it. So the government's job is to redistribute. Let's just like start there. It makes no sense that people in this country can work 40, 50, 60 hours a week and not be able to afford decent housing, not be able to afford, you know, to, to go on a date night or like that makes no sense in the richest country in the world in an extremely poor country or in a middle income country all right I, I can get that in America makes no sense why is that the case what did I say earlier about redistribution people corporations nonprofit civil society create a lot of value the government taxes and redis figures out a way to redistribute that value that's that's literally the issue. But if we get into the, the the real real of this, the government does a lot of redistribution. Who is it redistributing to? Exactly. And the answer is corporations. Right. And and they do it in very convoluted ways through tax breaks and things that it's 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 hard to see and through government contracts. But in this country, I don't. We just have this narrative against the poor, and we talk about the poor as if. The, poor equates to lazy, whereas what we're seeing on this tour is that poor usually means having two, three jobs because you're trying your best to cobble together 40 hours of work yeah. with no benefits, with nothing, because that's just what's, what's been being offered to you. Yeah. And when we talk about lifting folks up, 
when it's when it's to the poor, it's a handout all of a sudden. When it's to you know Amazon, massive tax credits, all of a sudden that's exactly. stimulating jobs, and it's 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 just it's just warp. We have a we have a country where we're serving corporations over people whereas if we serve people first the corporations would benefit because they have customers now and they have and they have employees who are healthy who are educated who are able to go and contribute and my 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 issue with this is that this is what happens throughout human history when you get to a point where an empire gets complacent and you get to the point where you assume that being on top is just the way it's always going to be. It happened with Rome, it happens across the board, and then all of a sudden, you just start fighting over the pie as opposed to putting everything you can into growing that pie. And that's where we are as a country and why I want to push for this so hard so we can get back to saying all these super impoverished people, all these immigrants that we have coming into the country, all these people who want to achieve the American dream, give them enough so they can do it. And then we can stay <laughs> as Absolutely. America. Absolutely. That's how we got here. Right. That is exactly how we got here. If you look at, I mean, Bank of America, that was started by an immigrant. Uh, and he built that bank for hardworking, poor immigrants who were left out of the banking system in, in California. Started, they started, actually started at Bank of Italy, changed the name to Bank of America. And his focus, Amadio Giannini, was to serve hard-working, poor, you know, immigrants. I've spent more time in America than I have in, in Nigeria, or, you know, anywhere else in the world. Um, and I love, I love, I love this country. I, I really do. So g given all that, you said you were 16 when, yeah, when you got yeah. to college. How did you figure out how to get over here? Like, what was that, what was that like? Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> with market opportunities, right? Um, there are organizations in uh, every part of the world, I think, mm -hmm. that help you prepare to get into university in the United States. You know, take the SATs and you know, the ACTs or whatever else. And I, I went to one of those organizations and um, I went to some lessons. They you know, helped me out, I took the exam. And then I, uh, I got into college at Fisk University, a historically black college. University of Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, thankfully, I got a scholarship, so I was there for a few years. And then my junior year, I transferred. Um, I was fortunate again to get a scholarship to, to Vanderbilt. Um, and I don't know, I think when I was 16, I was, I, I suppose I was an old soul. <laughs> I always had friends a few years older than me. Uh, I was very aware of what the life I had left in Nigeria and I mean, I wasn't here to mess around. I, I, I had to. I had to do well. Success was um, not not an option, right? Uh, and so, you know, you had heads down. You studied. You worked hard. And I was fortunate to get a job after graduation. And um, the rest is sort of history. And that's that's what a, that's what the basic income is all about. Is so that as opposed to waiting until an emergency happens or having someone have to create a page saying. I need the basics. We just say across the board as Americans, we believe that everyone in this country deserves food, clothing, shelter, and transportation. You know, end poverty, make trillions, that's what needs to start happening now. Because at the end of the day, we gotta start looking out for each other.